This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today, we are going to talk about a crow who tampered with a crime scene twice, Nikola Tesla's obsession with pigeons, and are you liable if your murderer of crows commits a murder? All right, let's go. This week is another bird special, but this, I promise, was not on purpose. See, I started researching pigeons because it turns out city pigeons played an inspirational role in Nikola Tesla's life. Who's Nikola Tesla? Well, you wouldn't be able to hear my voice on these speakers or through your computer without the advancements that Nikola Tesla made and the competitive nature of Thomas Edison. You know him, right? The light bulb guy? So diving into that, I stumbled into this cute crow piece that was a much deeper well to pull from than I expected. One where crows saved a person earlier this year. So then I thought, well, I'll just add more cute crow stories, fluff this piece out a bit more, and I found one. Ooh, a cheeky internet crow. Look, he stole a knife from a murder scene. So let's meet Canuck as a quick sidebar into this other story on crows. But Canuck was also a much bigger story than I thought and he needed his own segment. This entire episode is just three stories that sort of just, well, flocked together. So as we have a bit of crow talk, I wanted to address this up at the top because I felt like an idiot, never understanding a very common joke that I see going around the internet until I finally gave up at age 40 and looked it up. There is this famous joke. I keep seeing it, and it's it's got these two crows with the words attempted murder on the meme. And it turns out a group of crows is called a murder. And that part I knew. But what I didn't know is that a group is considered three, not two. So two crows is not a murder. It's an attempted murder. So the joke is twofold. Two crows, not a murder or a group. But an attempted murder is also a felony where someone tries to kill someone else. Don't do that. So it's a legal pun or a play on words. So we'll be meeting a bird named Canuck who is involved in a crime scene in a little bit. And given the topic, I figured that joke would be a great icebreaker. But it really is more of a visual joke. So like hearing about it, it's not really the best medium. Just roll with it. I'll put something up on Facebook. I don't know. There's also this popular phrase, or at least the title of an Incubus album from the early 2000s. It's called a crow left of the murder. It's a saying that means one isn't quite flying with the flock or marches to their own drum. And I kind of feel like if you're listening to this show, you are probably a crow left of the murder. And I welcome you wholeheartedly. So cool, cool. Now that we've got our language situated, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and review. As of this recording on 311, we have four days left for your chance to get a sticker, a shout out for you or your friend, or both, and or a story of your choosing about any animal that you like. All you have to do is leave a written review, and we'll choose three at random. As there are only three reviews right now, your chances are pretty good of winning. So don't forget to do that. It helps this podcast get to more people and have more people hear about these freaky deaky little animals who inspired history, makes us laugh, makes us think advances of science, all of it. So pause this now if you like, leave a review on iTunes, and then come right back and join me. Okay, so you know what? I'll just wait. (music) 
cool, you're back. So now let's go on to the good stuff. Crows are famously attracted to shiny objects, like beads, metal, knives from a crime scene. In 2016, Vancouver police were called to a scene where a car was engulfed in flames in a McDonald's parking lot. But when police arrived, they saw the flaming sedan dangerously close to another car. Because, you know, cars, fire, gas, oil, boom. But they had to deal with another serious threat, too. A guy wielding a knife. Police ended up shooting the man who went to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. That's how you know it's Canada. The knife was dropped, the fire was put out, and all was good, right? Well, once things cooled down, they could start their investigation. Might as well get a shamrock shake while you're here waiting, right? But a crow with a red band on his leg decided to pick up something shiny on the ground inside the crime scene. Reporter Mike Howell had watched as the crow flew down, picked up the knife in his beak like he was going to go on his own crime spree, and then flew about 15 to 20 feet with the Vancouver Police Department in hot pursuit. The crow dropped the knife and flew away, but was not arrested for tampering with a crime scene. The crow was later spotted at the same scene trying to get camera equipment out of the back of the burned-out sedan. So who is this frisky flying felon? The red band was a dead giveaway, as there was only one popular crow with a red band in all of Vancouver. He was an official celebrity. And while I'm thinking of him as a smaller, more fly-y version of Andre the Seal from last week, the wild animal who got a little too close to humans, liked to be cheeky but really irritated locals, Canuck the Crow had garnered international fame. In short, Canuck fell out of a nest and was abandoned, so he was hand-raised by humans. After he had aged up a bit and was able to survive on his own, he was fitted with a red band to signify to birdwatchers that he had had direct contact with humans. However, after a few days of his release, one of the men who lived on the property where Canuck was raised noticed that the bird was finally gone off the property. So he decided just to take a little walk just to see how far the crow had gone. He ended up coming across Canuck in an open grassy field, apparently scared and confused. And when the bird saw the neighbor, a familiar face, he ran up in his little birdie way. Hop, hop, hop. The neighbor put his arm up and Canuck flew to it. Ready to hitch a ride. Thinking this was just the coolest thing ever, here's this guy just walking downtown Vancouver with a giant crow on his arm like a modern-day goth. But this was not the last time. Canuck officially adopted Sean and stayed in the area and even flew with him to the bus stop and would wait for Sean when he came home from work. Canuck was spotted riding the train. Not on the train. In the train car, where the people go. Not carrying a weapon, just chilling on the subway seats. Over the years, Canuck had become so famous, a movie was made about him and his human friend Sean, the neighbor who helped him in the field that day. Canuck would frequent the skate parks where he would hop on skateboards. He loved betting on the ponies at the track. He would steal golf balls from people playing putt-putt. He took on a hawk with four of his crow friends. A hawk. And I think the most impressive of all of Canuck's achievements... He beat out beloved Canadian actor and national treasure, Michael J. Fox, Marty McFly himself, in a Metro Vancouver unofficial mascot. Over 300,000 votes were cast. But as Canuck was comfortable going up to people, all kinds of people, particularly groups of people, he went missing in August 2019 at four years of age. Sean became understandably worried. Canuck had not been seen since. With one exception, maybe. There was a post on Craigslist which is widely thought to be a hoax in the Canuck Crow circles. And while it's likely Canuck has passed away, it's also quite possible that someone captured him and brought him into their home as he was familiar with people and would often fly up to them. Or maybe he could have been harmed, hit by a car, caught by a hawk, or any number of things that happen to outdoor creatures. My sincere hope is that Sean gets the closure that he's looking for, which is so hard for wildlife. Until then, Canuck 
If you're out there, buddy, we're pulling for you, you cheeky Corvid. And if you've crossed over the Rainbow Bridge, I hope you're keeping everyone up there on their toes. <laughs> Back in the late 1800s, there was a legit battle royale for the very soul, spirit, and execution of how we would come out of the Candle Ages. In the red corner, we have Thomas Edison, proponent of the DC current. And given employees for Edison invented the electric chair, it was a literal execution of how we would come out of using candlelight to get by. Not ideal. And in the blue corner, we have Nikola Tesla, AC Current, a guy who loved animals, but he absolutely laid the foundation for every single thing that we use today for communication on Earth and in space, electricity in your homes, and even mechanics that allow engines to run, cars to move, the internet to function a century before we even had the internet. He brought us electricity that we still use in the same way today, and thanks to this battle royale... We also have the name of one of the best hair bands of the 1970s and 80s, ACDC. There are so many great writings and podcasts and even an episode of Bob's Burgers that demonstrates what an absolute monster Thomas Edison was, while also a brilliant salesperson. I'm just going to let you follow your own curiosity into those waters for anything beyond what I cover here. There are going to be tons of links in today's episode. Instead, I... I'm just going to talk a little more broadly about the Serbian immigrant who reshaped American science, the man who changed our world from candlelight to the electric grid, Nikola Tesla. And if you've ever seen a lightning show with the Tesla coils, you know, Tesla coils, hmm? or have passed behind a Tesla on the highway, you know, those all electric cars with the IUD looking logo co-created by Elon Musk, the guy who shot a car into orbit a few years ago. Tesla's brain was his superpower and ultimately his downfall. But how did an aspiring poet decide to become the father of pretty much all things electric? Boogie woogie woogie? He was zapped by his cat via static electricity. <coughs> this is something that happens frequently if you have a pet. And instead of going, ow, or, huh, that's the third time today, he wanted to know why this happened and how electricity works and the rest is history. A very complicated, tumultuous, frustratingly exciting history. So while most cats become famous for breaking things or looking grumpy, this one is essentially sparking the entire industrial revolution. Because while there were other inventors and marketing geniuses and thieves who stole ideas and didn't pay for them, <coughs> Edison, <coughs> we can thank Nikola Tesla's cat for literally zapping Tesla and figuratively igniting the idea for going forward with investigating electricity. So no. Thomas Edison is not the guy to thank for electricity entirely. Nope, he was just very good at selling ideas and performing. While Tesla loved animals, Edison famously, I'm sorry kids, electrocuted cats and dogs and one elephant named Topsy to death to demonstrate the power of electricity and so he could win the battle for the electrical current over Nikola Tesla's AC current. Edison being extra is what really fueled the media and public fascination with this feud, whereas Tesla just wanted to invent things and ultimately help people. Edison wanted to sell and win. The light bulb wasn't even Edison. The light bulb was invented by 22 other people. Edison was just very good at marketing and selling it to people. He could put on a show. Edison, the performer he was, was trying to demonstrate how dangerous Tesla's power could be. All electricity is dangerous if not handled correctly. And so he created the first electric chair, which is problematic. Especially when the first guy put to death survived for eight minutes and the voltage didn't kill him, despite being sold as a more humane way of carrying out the death penalty compared to hanging. In fact, we have Tesla to thank for more than just electricity that you watch Bluey or Brooklyn Nine-Nine on, cell phone charging, computers that run on electricity, dishwashers that wash our dishes with electricity, and most of the Industrial Revolution. We can also thank Tesla for all appliances and not needing to wash our clothes with a washboard. The AC power that Tesla created is not necessarily better or worse than DC power, Edison's power. 
And in fact, you need both in your home right now. The AC power can get from where it's generated into your home via the outlet much more efficiently than DC current, which is why every home on the electric grid uses AC power to get electricity into the house via outlet. And if you use something that uses a battery to store a charge, like a laptop or a cell phone, that is converted to DC power. So thanks to Tesla for homes being lit as well as a short list of other things that he directly invented or had a hand in that you might not realize. A short list. Electrical generators, FM radio, remote control technology, which naturally led to freaking robots, spark plugs, fluorescent lights, and the Tesla coil, a machine that only purpose is to shoot lightning bolts inside at science museums everywhere. He harnessed the power of Niagara Falls into the first hydroelectric power plant. He made groundbreaking discoveries in the fields of physics, robotics, steam turbine engineering, and magnetism. Inventors used his patents and discoveries to create x-rays. While he got zero credit for it, radar, cryogenic engineering, you know, keeping dead animals and people cold and preserved enough to hopefully bring them back to life. And possibly by way of that, he invented the sci-fi trope of people being cryogenically frozen and suspended in space-time. Patents over a hundred years ago that eventually became the transistor. That's the thing that allows you to send and receive information on technology like the internet. Neon lights, the electric motor, electric communications, recording radio waves from space. Basically, he became the big daddy of radio astronomy before we even had a space program, which I didn't even know was a thing until today. And while I have to keep going back and rereading sources as I make these scripts and notes to get everything as accurate as I can, Tesla could just read a book and recite pages at will. That would be so much easier. Most amazingly, Tesla was able to imagine creations that weren't even built yet, and in his brain he could just piece things together to see if they would work without using pencil and paper, models, blocks, computers, Lego, or any tangible thing. He could just picture an entire engine in his head and think, yeah, that'll work, and it freaking did. But like most things, his gift was a double-edged sword. Tesla's ideas became more and more intense as he got older and he descended further and further into absolute madness. In fact, Tesla was famously a germaphobe, which makes his fascination with pigeons even more bizarre. Pigeons are not the cleanest animals in a city, though I personally love them. Shout out to Cherami, the war pigeon who saved 194 men in World War I from Episode 7. Tesla would leave his window open in his hotel room where he lived, probably for the free cable and excellent room service. He'd leave the window wide open to let pigeons come and go. He would feed them and have full-out conversations with them in a park, and he would try to nurse them back to health if they were injured. In 1922, his favorite pigeon died. Now, with the passing of any animal is tragic, but perhaps even more so in the depths of Tesla's psyche, he famously did not marry or have relationships as he was afraid it would interfere with his study, his work, his creativity, his mind. He even said, I do not think you can name many great inventions that have been made by married men. Well, here's a list of married men inventors. Tim Berners-Lee, The World Wide Web. John Bardeen, The Transistor, something that he bounced off of Tesla's work. Alexander Graham Bell, you know, the telephone guy. Ernest Swinton, The Tank. David Fairchild, extensive world traveler who introduced plant species to the world, including introducing cotton to the American Southwest. Carl Benz, the inventor of the Benz patent motor car, wildly accepted as the first practical motor car. He also invented a two-stroke engine and speed regulation systems in cars. Frederick Branting, co-discovered insulin, which saves 7.4 million Americans every year. And Charles Best, the other guy who discovered insulin and its practical usage. However, maybe for him, for Tesla, this assertion worked. But remember, kids, an N of one of your own experience is not globally generalized. But Tesla put all of his energy into these pigeons, one in particular that he loved. And this is a quote. I loved that pigeon as a man loves a woman and she loved me. And as long as I had her, there was purpose in my life. But pigeons don't have the longest lifespans on the streets, especially not in 1922. Tesla was absolutely not mentally healthy. 
He was very secluded in his hotel room with no one but pigeons and found joy in only his hotel room slash lab, which feels a lot like my bedroom slash office that I've been navigating since last March. Thanks, COVID. He was suffering from bouts where he didn't even realize what was reality and what was a hallucination, which is really sad. This is the greatest mind and founder of modern life, and this is how he went out. He said of this day in particular that his favorite pigeon had flown into his room to tell him she was dying. And as she was saying this, a white light shone from her eyes brighter than anything he ever generated with electricity, and she died. And as one would think, the genius mind that created all of this stuff a hundred years before many of these things could be used in a practical way would be rich and famous and rolling in the Benjamins. But no, he was surviving on hotel crackers crackers he would share with his pigeons. As the oatmeal comic by Matthew Inman said, more perfectly than anyone else I've seen, quote, living on crackers and talking to an imaginary laser pigeon? That was Tesla's reward for all the things that he gave to humanity? Dear Nikola Tesla, I'm sorry, so very, very sorry. You were a man displaced in time, in Archimedes, Steve Wozniak, Tony Stark of the 19th century. You were the greatest geek to ever live. He then said his life work was finished when the pigeon died, but his debt was not finished. He racked up three G's in fines at the Hotel Regis, and he would not pay for it, so he ended up having to move to another hotel, showed his pigeon homies where he was located, and eventually got kicked out of that hotel, too. Because I guess complaints from other hotel patrons complaining of flying rats is an evictable offense. That is an insult to both rats and pigeons, but yes, bird poop in hotel rooms, absolutely a health concern. It also might have been the contribution to his mental condition, or maybe just having all these birds was a symptom of his mental health. This might be a real snake-eating-its-tail situation here. There are suggestions that Tesla suffered from obsessive-compulsive disorder that was never diagnosed, and that he was obsessed with the number three. He would wash his hands three times. Then he would walk around a building three times before entering. Apparently, women who wore pearls were somehow a problem, as Tesla hated both pearls and the women who wore them. Tesla suffered, and that's the correct term here, from hallucinations. And this was without licking the cane toads from episode 18. He had to have 18 napkins on a table, count his steps, and he stated that he had a higher than normal sensitivity to sounds, which is somebody who lives under three bachelors in an uninsulated apartment building. I am so sorry, Mr. Tesla. After his death in 1943, alone in a hotel room, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI had to take all of his plans and lock them away for safekeeping. Because death rays, a weapon to make world peace, and a bathtub that can clean you with just electricity, while a great way to conserve water, are all probably bad ideas in practice and not good ideas in the wrong hands. Nikola Tesla, I agree. You were the greatest geek to ever live. And thank you for giving me the electricity I needed to make this podcast. And the next time I go see some pigeons today, I'll tell them you said hi. As seen on Reddit legal advice, of which I hope most of you are not getting your only legal advice from the front page of the internet? The question, I accidentally created an army of a murder of crows. Am I liable if the crows murder someone? I'm intrigued. In short, this 20-something person in Portland, Oregon, where else, had read that one could befriend crows by feeding them and being friendly. What started off as five crows turned into 15 who started bringing gifts to the author of the post. And generally, everyone in the neighborhood loved it until the neighbors would come over to be friendly in a socially distant and responsible manner, COVID, and the crows would dive bomb, make a ruckus, and would not stop until the neighbor would leave the author's yard, which is what sparked this question in the legal corner of Reddit. These crows were not trained to attack or to be mean in any way. They just got a bit protective of their general. 
So what's fascinating about this story is that crows are hands down one of the smartest creatures on the planet. I once worked with a woman at Northeastern University who was super into crows. And while I cannot remember her name to save my life, I do remember that she loved crows. She told me to watch a documentary on smart animals from PBS, which I did. And one of them was a crow who had figured out how to break unbreakable nuts to eat. This crow would take this nut to a busy intersection. And when the light would change red, the crow would drop the nut in just the right spot for the cars to run it over, and then the crow would fly away to safety. When the light would turn green, the cars would hit the nut, ultimately break it by the time the next light cycle came around. And when the light turned red again, the crow would just fly down and eat the meat of the nut. That is some great A problem solving. Crows also famously remember people who are nice to them and might bring them gifts like beads and rocks and metal paper clips and maybe knives from a crime scene if you're Canuck the Crow. But they absolutely remember when people are mean to them and will attack and squawk and dive bomb and just make things difficult, especially if you unwittingly find yourself a bit too close to their nest or a baby. So that said, in this case, the individual who, quote, accidentally created a crow army has the best update ever. They had called the Audubon Society, good move, who suggested something that I would suggest in dog training. When I work with fearful and scared dogs, my goal is to build trust. And so I don't look them in the eye. I just toss food to them. I give them space. And if the dog chooses to come over and check, I don't make sudden movements. I have to build trust and comfort, and it's always at the dog's pace. The Audubon Society had suggested to the OP to just toss food to the crows and just be chill. Apparently, the entire community now feeds the crows, and everyone gets along and watches over each other. I want to go to there. But here is my favorite part of this entire story. Quote, Most amazingly, the crows may have legitimately saved my neighbor's life. Our city had a pretty big ice and snow event recently. Like I said in my last post, most of my neighbors are older. One of my neighbors was walking down his steep driveway, slipped, and couldn't get back up. The crows started going ballistic and were making more noise than we have ever heard. A different neighbor went out to see what was up and found the gentleman in his driveway. Neighbor is mostly okay, just some serious bruises. Needless to say, the crows have been getting some high-value food since then. So make friends with your crows. They are amazing. And watch any nature, PBS special, YouTube documentary you can on crows. They are smarter and way more frisky than you think. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or other birds who have impacted a crime scene, send it in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mudstuff Media, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, the oldest AKC obedience club in the country, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this show. Now go get curious. I got today's information on Canuck the Crow from the Dodo, VancouverIsAwesome.com, CBC.ca, Audubon.org, NationalGeographic.com, and lots of Facebook and Twitter posts that follow Canuck. I got today's information from Tesla and his pigeon obsession from HistoryToday.com, BadassOfTheWeek.com on Tesla, TheOatmeal.com, PBS.org, Britannica.com, HuffPost.com, BusinessInsider.com, SmithsonianMag.com, TeslaUniverse.com, LiveScience.com, SmithsonianMag.com, and MaximumFun.org. There was a Sawbones podcast episode on Ozone that interestingly tied in really well to Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. So if you get a chance to listen to that episode on Ozone, it's a great family-friendly podcast and I cannot recommend it enough. Forbes.com and an episode of No Such Thing as a Fish 
episode 305, No Such Thing as a Sentient Jelly. Lastly, on Crow Murder Murder Responsibility, we have a Reddit post on legal advice on I accidentally created an army of crow and the BBC. The update is also on Reddit. More information on crows was found by pbs.org and nationalgeographic.com. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episodes. Music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. Thank you.